Okay. Um, thanks everyone for coming, also for staying so late uh, on the last day. Um, today I'm gonna basically going to cover a bit about um, service operations. So basically what are service operations, how are they different from existing operations, basically existing DevOps operations, uh, and basically how can you use them personally uh, and benefit from them. And so basically these, uh, these uh, lessons I basically am gonna share with you are basically things that we've been, been uh, learning and taught by talking to our, our users uh, from uh, Fission. And Fission, uh, which is, is basically a open source fast serverless platform on Kubernetes, uh, for which basically I work at Platform 9. Okay, so um, big room. So I'm not sure, I, I'm sure some of you have already uh, got an introduction to serverless. Uh, I just want to have a quick recap. I, I, trust me, it will be quick. Um, so why serverless? I think that's based on three uh, characteristics. One is the operational model. Uh, so basically there it's about um, that you as a user um, defer so much of your, so as much as possible your operational logic to the uh, cloud provider. So basically you, only need to, you should only need to focus on your actual business logic, actual, the actual code that you care about. All other things should be deferred to as much as possible to the cloud provider. And in return you get a lot of things for, for, for free uh, back. So one of these is the, um, that the cloud provider does the auto-scaling for you, uh, and other things basically get, you get for free is basically monitoring, health checking, and all that sort. The other, next to the operational model, we have the cost model, and that's maybe the one thing that's more, more famous for uh, serverless than the uh, auto-scaling part, and it's basically you only pay for the actual resource that you use, uh, and you don't pay basically for reserving uh, machine instances that you don't fully utilize. Uh, in the next slide, you, don't, you also don't pay any upfront costs or parallel costs that are not directly correlatable to your usage. And finally, even if you do use your, your uh, service application, uh, you, pay, so you do so in a very granular way. So you pay for it by the millisecond instead of by the hour, day, or month in more traditional uh, cloud models. And finally, you have the development model where basically uh, in, in service, you really try to uh, focus, you, you're working on as close as possible to the business logic, so you're also using high-level abstractions, uh, generally, like, such as functions or queries. Uh, and next to that, also the cloud provider tries, tries to provide you with uh, as much services as possible, so that you don't have to do grunt work of integrating with a, a storage service or with a message queue. And finally, uh, service is, is really about being, also being language agnostic. There's no real, um, language specific features that you're using. Um, so you basically can fit the language that, you're, that you need to the business pro problem you're trying to solve. So then, and as you can imagine, it's quite, still quite uh, abstract and there are a lot of, uh, of these uh, serverless uh, systems that fit, or serverless models that fit this description from serverless containers to serverless uh, databases. But today I'm gonna focus fully on uh, function as a service uh, or just FAS. And the idea of FAST is basically that you, as a developer, you, you express your business logic in functions. And these functions you uh, submit to the FAST platform, which is basically op which operated by an operator. And this operator can be public, it can be AWS, it can be Google, uh, but it can also be an internal DevOps team, which basically manages a self-deployed um, self FAST platform. And, th and the whole goal of this FAST platform is basically to turn your functions into function instances, which are basically workers uh, that process your events for these functions uh, and execute a function for it. And this basically, this allows you to, uh, to serve a, a certain uh, number of users, um, which basically form the workload, whether they are actual users or maybe just downstream services. And now you might be wondering, uh, this seems very simple, why an entire talk about service operations? Um, the problem here is that you don't, when you're using serverless, you don't just use um, a single function. Then when you, when you start investing into serverless architectures, you, uh, the, 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 the small, basically the constraint model of a function is basically forces you sort of to keep your functions very small and also the cost of adding a new function is very cheap. So as you can see in a recent survey, uh, on AWS, the, uh, users really uh, have uh, more half the users have more than ten uh, functions, but some some have hundreds and others have thousands of functions. And you can imagine that like, once you have this number of, of functions, tens, hundreds, all going all being deployed, all in, in concurrent, uh, up, being upgraded, being deprecated, that suddenly it becomes much more complex to actually manage this overall picture, get a, get a, a good insight in this uh, in what's happening in your system. <clears throat> 
And for this, we need actual structured operational processes. Um, and luckily, there is, of course, a lot of existing work on this. Um, so we have this traditional, this traditional DevOps lifecycle, uh, which you probably have seen in some variation, uh, at least even, in, even on this conference. Um, but to basically walk you quickly through it, basically you have this development loop where you, basically you're, as a developer, you're, you're uh, making a change, you're implementing a feature, and you're basically constantly, uh, there's a constant interplay between coding and then trying to run a couple of tests to see if you actually, uh, if, if your program, program still runs and if it does what it should. And then basically once, you, once you're done, you, you move into the operation layer, operation loop, uh, where you build it, uh, test it, but then with a far bigger test suite, and then uh, release it, basically, or commit it into your code base, uh, your actual code base. And basically, from, from there, you basically deploy your, your functions um, to the actual production environment, and from there, you uh, start operating and monitoring it. And based, of course, when you, once you monitor it, you, you'll find new, new bugs, new performance issues, and uh, missing features, which you basically then, uh, again, start this development loop uh, in turn. So I might wonder, like, how does this change in serverless uh, computing, this, this basically this DevOps loop? Um, lucky, luckily, it doesn't. Um, basically, the core principles of this DevOps loop uh, should remain the same for serverless uh, service computing. You want to have this serv your serverless uh, applications fit into your workflow, into your, your processes, instead of adapting all your processes to this one single um, well, uh, catchphrase. So, um, but of course, you can imagine that within these, these stages, there are still uh, a lot of uh, differences. There's a lot of practices that are a bit different in serverless, and also serv practices that are specific to serverless. So today, I'm gonna, during the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna um, share with you basically, for each of these stages, basically what, what's different in serverless, um, or what you should watch for, uh, and um, basically what are good practices in general uh, when using a serverless. So first up, uh, the development loop. So basically, we're now basically uh, changing our feature, uh, implementing a feature. Um, and the key, the, the key thing of, uh, of this development loop, and basically this holds for any application, not just a serverless one, is that you should keep it as small and as fast as possible. Um, basically, to keep this, this feedback to this user as far, um, almost instant. Uh, and in for service, this is also the same, but also there's also a bit more uh, a bit more tricky part to to the uh, to serverless, because um, because you, you generally when you start out, start out using serverless, you use just create an account on AWS or uh, Google Cloud, and you start basically using their services, and those are not really fitted for uh, fast and uh, scalable development. So now instead of basically having this, uh, where you're, you're waiting for your, your code to compile, you now you're waiting for your code to be uploaded, for to be deployed and to be uh, exposed to, to your, the, your VPC, for example. Uh, and it's not, of course, sorry, not, not to say that uh, it's not a good place to start. Like these, the, these online uh, editors that basically all files providers uh, show, uh, have, sorry, uh, really are a good, great uh, point to start exploring serverless, uh, to basically prototype bit, to maybe for a small hackathon to create, quickly set up some features. But there are some limitations to these online editors. Um, and basically, there, there, there are a couple. Um, so one is the, that they are limited, that they have limited uh, functionality. Uh, some, most of the times, the, the API of your fast platform has more functionality than is presented in the editor. Um, and next to that, the, the, uh, they're also just missing, they're, they're missing the, the typical AD, uh, IDE uh, functionality. Uh, IDE functionality, um, like, where, like your favorite uh, IDE has like advanced typing, uh, like your, 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 your self-defined macros, and so forth. And finally, also, these online editors also mi are missing a, a bit of a, a good, a good version control because they're, they're not, you cannot really get them from there into your own version control system. So you're basically sort of dependent on AWS to implement this for you. Um, and they do, they do create some, for example, they do create a snapshot for every time your function that gets deployed. Uh, but there's still basically there's a, there's a disconnect between your, your own uh, processes, so your own version control system and that of AWS. Uh, and of course, And of course, uh, the answer is very simple, just develop locally. And luckily, uh, these functions that we define in service are not special. They don't require some special API. They can just be uh, developed in your own 
um, IDE. And there are some projects that actually help you uh, further de de um, develop your, your service applications. Uh, so for example, AWS SAM, a uh, service application model, which basically allows you to also specify um, the, co the, co the function configuration in code, so which basically like that you have the function and the configuration in the same um, environment, and you, you, you basically upload them to AWS in the same package. And service, the service framework does the same thing, but it also tries to be a bit more agnostic, so that they try to, um, basically that you, if you define your function for AWS, it's relatively easier to um, also convert it to a, an, an Azure function. So that's basically, so we basically develop, we're now basically developing locally, but still if, we, if we're testing our functions, and we still always have to upload them to, the, to AWS, to Google Cloud, um, and um, that, take, that takes a lot of time. So there are a couple of options here to actually uh, also speed this, this part of the, the local development experience up. Uh, one is basically with using a fast emulator. So pretty much every uh, managed fast platform has uh, one or multiple uh, emulators, which basically, um, well, they implement the, the same API as AWS, but are far, far simpler, are open source, uh, and basically are a good, a good way to actually test your uh, functions offline. But of course, like if, you're, if you have your functions, you, um, if, you have, if you have functions, those are typically like glue code, so they, they are interacting with uh, services. Uh, so you're still, if you want to fully test those, you still have to sort of uh, interact with the cloud. And now you can, you, can, you can go even further and say basically I want to emulate everything. Uh, and there's a, a nice project called LocalStack that actually tries to do this. Um, basically, they, they've basically em emulated, at least they claim, I haven't really checked it, um, that they uh, emulate basically the entire API, the entire API of uh, AWS. Um, and they, but the problem with these, these systems is, and if you've been around in cloud computing uh, for longer than you've, you've recognized that these, uh, that these attempts have been made over, over, multi, over multiple years also, is that basically they, these, um, these projects are quite difficult to do because you have to constantly, this, this local stack has constantly has to uh, keep in sync with AWS and uh, you, basically constantly um, yeah, keep in sync with AWS. And AWS is constantly uh, evolving, of course. So it's, it's difficult to keep these, these two in sync. And similarly, um, you could try to use AWS SAM uh, local, which also is an emulator for files, uh, but also for some of these services that are related to this. Um, and so it's far smaller than the local stack scope, but it's, um, but it's at least it's, it's, it's uh, developed by AWS, so that's the, the, the chance that they are keeping sync will be bigger. But still, you as a user have also has to be in sync, so you have to constantly pull, ensure that you're using the latest version of AWS SAM local. Uh, so it's tricky, but you can try to explore it if, uh, if you think it's uh, useful. Uh, so the third option is uh, using an open source fast platform. So that restricts you a bit in what you can choose. Uh, but the advantage of these fast platforms, of these open source fast platforms is in the name, of course, uh, you can deploy them anywhere. So you can basically deploy the same, the exact same version in your, in your production and in your development. So basically keeping your uh, development environment and your production environment in sync. Um, so now we basically, basically we're, we're developing locally, we're testing maybe at least a unit test locally. Uh, can we go even further? So um, this is something where we can take a look at the, uh, the front end community. Uh, they're, they're basically, like, uh, when you're working on your website, you typically have many, many tools which basically watch your, your file system, and uh, once you make changes to your website, your website source code, you immediately get, uh, basically this get, immediately gets recompiled and deployed to a, to the, to a local website, and your uh, browser gets refreshed. And this, like, this instant feedback is actually pretty nice. Um, if it, and so if it, we, can we can actually try to replicate this in, uh, in, fa in FAS. So we can do this with basically using a uh, well, very simple uh, do-it-yourself uh, type of thing, uh, where you just uh, watch your, your file system deploy your new your functions when it changes. Um, but also there's, there are now more and more um, file service platforms that actually try to also move towards this kind of developer experience. Uh, so two are a bit related, uh, Netlify and Zeit, uh, which are both basically service platforms that, that um, focus really on making serverless web applications. So they really try to follow this front-end workflow um, and also using this, this, live, this, this live reloading. 
Uh, in Fission, we have also a feature for this, uh, which basically builds and deploys your, your functions in Kubernetes as you are working on them. Okay, so now we have basically, okay. <laughs> okay, um, yes. So now we have the, um, we've basically did our chains. Uh, so we're now basically trying, we're trying to basically put it into the operational loop. Uh, so we're, we first need to build this. Um, okay, so, okay. Uh, so the, basically the build, pipe, the build stage is basically about turning your function sources into actual deployable functions. And this depends a bit on how you, what kind of fast platform you use. Some use, a Docker, use Docker images, some use uh, archives. But the, the core principle remains the same. Um, so, it also depends, so also this build pipeline, the exact implementation depends really on the language that you use. So for example, in Google Cloud Functions, uh, if you are using Node.js uh, and you place a, a package to JSON file with your dependency in it, uh, in, the, in the build pipeline of Google, they will um, try to resolve your dependencies uh, when, when you're deploying your function. Um, yeah, so that, that's Google. Uh, also, for example, Knative has this, uh, has this project called uh, Build, which is also is, uh, the goal of this is also to provide like, a, a very high level DSL for, for uh, creating your uh, build pipelines. Um, yeah. And in some other cases, you, in some other cases, the service platforms really uh, encourage you to do it yourself, to build your own Docker images. And even in that case, uh, you should really try to focus on making it automated uh, to avoid basically these manual changes, which become tedious at some point. So um, moving on to, so we've, we've built these deployable functions. So we now again, we, we enter this, this testing loop, which is this, this time far larger than the um, the test that we did in the development environment. Uh, because certainly we don't, now don't, no longer have to care whether it's going, fa when it's go whether it's going fast. So this, yeah, you probably know this, this, this pyramid, this testing pyramid um, in service, some argue, uh, some argue that it's the same, some argue that it should be more like a, an, an Aztec uh, pyramid, I guess. Um, where basically you have far more uh, integration tests and end-to-end -end tests, which makes sense because your functions typically are very simple, uh, but they offer a lot of integrations. Uh, so this is an example, like you have this small function which integrates with two, three services. Uh, and one, one core, uh, uh, with one way to, to uh, do this integration test is to, uh, make it, to write your function in such a way that you can stop out these, um, these services one by one. So you can really focus your, your integration tests on um, between your function and one service. So basically you have, one, you have uh, three integration tests for each of the, um, the dependencies or the, the services which are integrated. Um, and the basically, this basically also this allows you to keep your, your test simple and also allows you to root cause which service has, has changed, has become incompatible with your function. And some other, uh, some smaller tips, uh, we try to, so using this, try to avoid hard coding any, uh, ser any, any service related details. Um, really focus, really uh, separate your testing from your um, production environment. Uh, so use different AWS accounts, use different uh, Kubernetes clusters. And in your testing environments, be careful, uh, uh, set limits, set alerts, add some monitoring, uh, because uh, you don't want to have some runaway function triggering all kinds of expensive uh, services. Okay, um, so we have basically, we have basically built our, 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 our function, we've tested it, uh, so now it's ready, uh, we can actually start focusing on the release, so getting it into the code base and releasing a new version of our uh, function. And for this, yeah, I've, I've seen this introduction for, for GitOps like, a couple of times, at, even at this conference. Um, so I'm just gonna keep it very simple. Uh, the, the idea of, of GitOps is basically that you put everything, everything uh, related to your application, related to the deployment in the, in the same uh, Git repo. Uh, so basically it becomes a single source of truth in your, um, in your uh, system or in your uh, architecture. And from, basically from this Git repo, um, your CD tooling uh, watches for, for changes, watches for new commits, and basically gets triggered to uh, redeploy. So the question, of course, is because you have this, this, um, this deployment configuration, uh, the question, of course, how do you actually um, represent this, how do you actually store this in your Git repo? Um, 
And so one option is to do it imperatively, so basically uh, having a small bash script which basically deploys your, your function. Uh, but there are two issues with this. Uh, one is that basically uh, it's, it's basically littered with, with implicit operational details because so suddenly now you, have, now you have to know that you need to deploy it in this order. So you need to deploy the, the environment after the the, before the function and the trigger before after the, the function. Um, and the other issue with this is basically it's, it's very brittle because uh, your, your uh, CD pipeline cannot do much more than just deploy your function. Uh, sorry, don't just run this, this script and if it, something fails, it doesn't know how to recover. So the alternative is, um, which I guess because it's KubeCon, uh, everyone knows right now is to use um, declarative configuration. So similar to Kubernetes specs. Um, so here's an example of basically the same uh, operation but done in, in a declarative, uh, basically in a declarative way. Uh, so, and it's basically, the, I think the key, the key advantage of this approach is basically that you uh, lose the first issue I mentioned earlier. So that the, the operations, so that the, basically you don't have to worry, that you don't have to uh, worry about the operations inside your um, configuration. So instead, you just you declare the desired state of your system, um, and the system itself does the operations to try to reconcile the, the, the current state to this desired state. Um, and yeah, I think and most serverless, most service pro projects uh, understand these, these advantages, and they uh, basically every, form, uh, every system has a declarative, at least a declarative way to specify your configuration. So it was SAM service framework, and basically every open source fast platform that's on top of uh, Kubernetes, uh, because they want to integrate with Kubernetes, you're sort of forced to use declarative configuration, which is a good thing. Um, Moving on, uh, so we have this, we basically have uh, merged our changes into the actual code base. And we are now basically ready to deploy the, um, we're now basically ready to deploy um, the application or the function. Uh, for this, we can uh, actually, we can actually take a bit of a detour um, and basically look a bit into how a fast platform deploys the functions. I, I know I, I said that you shouldn't need to know any, any operational logic of the fast platform, but it's actually uh, kind of useful to know. So bear with me. So in the fast platform, there's a router uh, component, which basically is the, the component which decides where to send your, your, your event to. So uh, if there's a function instance, it will send it there. Otherwise, it will basically uh, issue to the deployer request for a certain function instance. This deployer basically knows, decides how a function should be deployed, uh, what kind of resources it should, should use, and it uh, offloads the actual scheduling and deployment of these, these functions to a research manager. And of course, this is Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes basically takes the function from the function store and uh, deploys it as a function instance. So now we have this function instance, and we can immediately route, basically, we can route this event to the function instance uh, for processing. Um, and this whole, this, this basically this long uh, cycle or long process is basically what we, what we call a cold start. It's basically the, the worst case possible path that your execution can take uh, to be execu executed. So in contrast, when we have now have a second event coming in, uh, and we, have, we still have this function instance around, so we can immediately uh, forward this event to the uh, function instance. Uh, and this uh, basically, okay. <laughs> uh, this is called, uh, it's not, it doesn't really have a name, but basically it's a warm execution. So basically it's the opposite of a, a cold start. Uh, and basically, with this knowledge, we can actually do some, some pretty interesting things to optimize your perform to optimize your functions, and that's basically to uh, do some caching inside your functions because functions are stateless; they cannot hold any uh, persistent state, but they can hold some non-persistent state like uh, caching. Uh, so imagine. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Okay, so imagine that you have this, um, we ask you go back to the uh, previous slide where we have this, this function instance being deployed. Uh, we can, when we deploy things, we, we deploy the, the function, we, we of course load the actual modules in, your, uh, in this function instance. So what you can do is basically you can put some code outside of your function handler, so outside of the function itself into this, the, the package level, uh, which basically gets executed when the function gets deployed. 
so this allows you to basically do some, some uh, premature caching, some, uh, maybe some set setting up of, of um, database connections if you're fast, but it doesn't do that for you. Um, and the same, way, the same thing you can do when you actually, uh, when you have these multiple ev events coming into for, to the same function instance. Uh, because now you can basically, uh, now you can, um, because they're using the same function instance, you can cache some results because you can simply uh, write to a static variable um, the results of an earlier operation and look them up when, they, uh, when the same request uh, occurs again. So that basically was the small detour uh, through uh, to uh, deployment optimizations. Um, now the actual back, basically back to a bit of a combination of the deployment and the testing. Um, so when you deploy your functions, you, even though you have tested them, you, you cannot really guarantee that you actually uh, have a full, that you, have, that you, have, you, have, you cannot have full confidence that you actually uh, have a working uh, function. So you still need to monitor it when, it, when you deploy it, that it actually uh, works and it works as, as uh, it should. And you can do this manually, but when you have these tens or hundreds of functions, uh, you, it quickly becomes well, far too tedious, far too difficult to actually keep track of which functions you should watch, which functions are already longer running and which are more stable. Uh, so that's why you basically can start to uh, basically automate this, this, these uh, deployments by using canary, canary deployments. Uh, and the idea of canary deployments is very simple. Um, what you do is basically you deploy the new version next to the old version, shift a bit of traffic from the, uh, to this, this new version and basically monitor uh, this new version um, uh, with, a, some, with some monitoring tool. Uh, and based on, this, based on these metrics, you, um, you generate a, an error rate. So for example, if you're, if you're watching an HTTP service, you, you watch for uh, 400 or 500 uh, in the, the HTTP status code. Uh, and based on this, this error rate, you set a threshold and your canary, canary, canary <laughs> controller either uh, shifts more and more traffic to this new, new version or if the uh, error rate is above the, uh, the threshold, it will uh, roll back the changes aboard the uh, deployment. And to give you an example of this, um, of this canary deployment style, uh, this is an example of, fission, of the fission canary deployments. And here you basically see an, uh, an example of a uh, succeeded canary, de canary deployment, where in green basically there's one, uh, the new version is getting more and more traffic as the red one uh, decreases in traffic. Um, and canary deployments are getting more and more adopted by service platforms. So um, at least I know AWS Lambda supports this by, using, uh, by combining it with uh, AWS Code Deploy. And uh, with, in service meshes, uh, basically canary deployments are almost one of the standard features. Uh, so basically when a fast platform uh, depends on a, uh, built on top of a uh, service mesh, uh, it will support uh, canary deployments such as Knative. So that brings us to the um, last part of the loop, which is basically, um, well, you've deployed your functions. Now it's now, now the last time to actually to take the long, long road and operate and monitor them. And unfortunately, yes, you still have to monitor uh, your uh, service applications because the cloud party cannot do anything for you. Uh, they, the, the cloud provider does um, manage a lot of the uh, manage a lot of the system level, um, uh, basically a lot of the system level uh, metrics. But at a, a higher level, the, the, the cloud provider can never know whether your function to operate as you actually intended and whether they meet internal SLAs. Uh, of course, they, the, service, the service platforms do help with this, so they, they do provide metri metric monitoring, log aggregation, storage, and distributed tracing. Um, but, and this, this saves you from a lot of, lot of uh, development issues, development trouble to actually set up this, and set up this uh, monitoring um, infrastructure yourself. But there are some pitfalls also, um, especially when you're using managed uh, fast platforms because this monitoring is not free. You still uh, get paid, get charged for, um, for example, how, how many logs you're, you're sending to the, um, to the log service. Um, and also, there's, there's a bit of a, 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 I personally think it's a, there's a bit of a, a vendor lock in, in this, this part of serverless um, because you're, you don't really have a choice which monitoring stack you're using. So when you're using AWS Lambda, you're using uh, CloudWatch. When you're using Google Cloud Functions, you're using uh, Stackdriver. And if you, even if you're using an open source fast platform, 
generally they, they still assume a certain uh, monitoring stack and it's hard to actually use a different one. And so and the re basically the remainder of this, uh, this talk, I want to spend a bit on things that you can, f you, you're likely to find when, you're, when you start operating and monitoring your functions for a longer time. Um, so the first one is basically um, that the memory allocation uh, actually impacts also the CPU and the I.O. Uh, of your function. So generally when you're using AWS Lambda, you're, uh, you can only set the, the resource allocation, or the, the resource uh, allocation for your function. Um, so and that might sound a bit weird then to, to set, give more um, memory to a, a function that's in principle CPU intensive, such as the uh, Fibonacci um, example here. But because they, they basically because under the hood the the fast provider does link the memory allocation to uh, the CPU shares and IO shares almost linearly, you'll see that basically even in these CPU intensive uh, functions, you'll gain a performance boost. Uh, another uh, performance issue or performance more of a performance uh, opportunity is basically that you can uh, opt for to not scale down to zero. And it goes a bit against the surface principles of not, uh, of basically not paying for things that you don't use. Um, but the idea is basically that if, you, if you're willing to pay more for your functions, uh, you might consider just le leaving them running um, for, for, um, for basically always. And this is not really well supported yet in fast platforms. So for example, I, I firstly only know that, uh, that Azure supports this using the minimal instances of the uh, premium plan thing. Uh, but in, it is very well supported in the uh, open source fast platforms because for the better or the worse, uh, you have full control of the configuration of your fast platform. Uh, yeah. So the final um, uh, performance issue that I found personally very interesting because I actually ran into it myself uh, is basically that the language actually does matter. Because um, I used to think like, in theory, of course, like Go might be fa a bit faster than, than Python, but for a single simple function with um, with uh, just a single single thread, it, it shouldn't really matter that much. Um, but in practice, actually, it does matter. And the reason for this is not because the language is because of the language, but it's more about the language implementation. Um, so I actually ran it into this when I was running Python on Azure, um, and I basically I, I found out there were all kinds of uh, weird limitations to Python, which turned out to be um, which turned out basically, basically because of uh, that Python was in a, in a more of a beta stage. Um, so it's, it's not, basically not to, that's not to say that uh, Python, you shouldn't do, never use Python. Uh, it's more to say when, when you're using, when you're starting to evaluate a service platform or try, thinking of switching, uh, do uh, read the actual documentation to find out which uh, products are uh, supported uh, better than better than the others, or and run some small benchmarks to see which languages you can use uh, and which use, which languages you better uh, keep away from for a while. Um, so that basically concludes the, the, the product, basically the, the, the DevOps life cycle, and also brings an end to this talk. Um, I try to summarize a bit the uh, basically lessons learned um, for, that I present this, this, this presentation. Um, but I think the main takeaway of this presentation, if there is one, um, is that basically serverless does still have, um, um, does still have ops. And um, especially when you're running ops, or basically when you're running service at scale, you really, you really need structured operational processes. And for this, the DevOps lifecycle is still uh, very relevant in service. And that's a good thing. Thanks. <laughs>